I wanted to have a very brief research review about sedentary time, um, just because I've been digging into some of this literature, and this kind of builds upon uh, some of your previous segments about walking, you know, because uh, a lot of times we think about sedentary time and we think about, okay, uh, it seems to have an independent deleterious impact on health and wellness. How might we rectify that? And one kind of proxy measurement you can use is daily step count, which, which you've kind of addressed. Generally speaking, if you have a, a pretty high step count, it's unlikely that you have a tremendous amount of total cumulative sedentary time because you're out there walking a lot. It also... It, it at least pl places an upward constraint on how much sedentary exactly, time yeah. you can have. Yeah, yeah. it's a proxy. It, yeah, it's yeah. not a perfect indicator, but generally speaking, if you have a high step count, that is likely to at least correlate with having relatively lower total sedentary time and theoretically relatively fewer very prolonged stretches of continuous sedentary time. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, if you have a pretty high step count, it means you're getting up, you're moving, you're walking, and generally speaking, having less total sedentary time and hopefully less continuous sedentary time as well. Um, so just to kind of build upon that, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the independent ramifications of sedentary time and a couple other strategies that you could use outside of just monitoring step count. Because I know for some people, monitoring step count, you know, there are some people that really like to have a very quantitative approach to their health and wellness. They like to track everything. They like everything to be numerical uh, and, and they can, you know, do different types of interventions to influence those numbers. Uh, but I wanted to talk about a couple other potential strategies. So first of all, it's important to establish that, you know, you established very effectively in previous episodes that low step count uh, seems to be associated with some deleterious outcomes related to health. Um, there are other meta-analyses that have looked not just at step count as a proxy, but specifically looking at different forms of sedentary activity and how those relate to health and wellness. So, for example, uh, there was a meta-analysis by Patterson and colleagues, and I'm going to link all three of these in the show notes. Uh, but Patterson and colleagues found that total sitting time and television viewing time were associated with higher risks of several different chronic disease outcomes. And that was despite controlling for physical activity. So we're talking about the independent impact of sedentary time that you can't necessarily offset by saying, hey, I, you know, I go for a jog three days a week. Like there is, uh, it's difficult to defend the case that regular participation in structured exercise completely nullifies the deleterious independent impact of being sedentary for large portions of the day, uh, especially for extended discrete periods of time. So Patterson and colleagues found this despite controlling for physical activity. Uh, Biswas and colleagues found significant associations between sedentary, uh, sedentary time and risk of a variety of negative health outcomes related to mortality and chronic disease incidents. Um, and this negative impact from excessive sedentary time, it was certainly more pronounced among people who had low physical activity levels, but the association still persisted after controlling for physical activity in the entire sample. Uh, and then finally, Eklund and colleagues found that sedentary time was significantly associated with mortality risk in individuals with low activity levels, low physical activity levels. Um, and it was interesting because they did some stratification by physical activity level. And, you know, like I said, the, the, uh, the association with negative health outcomes uh, was, or, or mortality risk, I should say, was significant in the lowest uh, third of physical activity levels. But if you look at the high activity, moderate activity, low activity kind of subgroups, within each of them, you could see the same pattern where regardless of where you fall, like having high activity level certainly attenuated, you know, especially like for, this is relevant to people who do structured exercise. It seems to attenuate the magnitude of the deleterious outcome from sedentary time, but the general relations, relationship still persists. What I, and what I mean by that is when you look at the low, medium, or high activity groups, within those groups, you can see that relationship where the higher your sedentary time gets, 
uh, the more likely that, that you're going to see an elevated risk of all cause mortality. Uh, so this is uh, collectively the, the literature indicates that, you know, certainly it's good to do structured exercise and to have, you know, a really intentional focus on getting out and doing discrete bouts of physical activity. Uh, but there's still an independent negative impact of really excessive sedentary time. And we, we see these kinds of things in, in uh, studies with athletes, right? Even competitive athletes, you can look at some, some research where within a cohort of competitive, highly, you know, you know really well-trained athletes, there are still associations between sedentary time and outcomes related to body composition, for instance. I know mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Helms, the other Eric, uh, reviewed a paper in Mass uh, a year or two ago looking at the fact that uh, among really well-trained athletes, higher sedentary time was associated with lower relative fat-free mass and higher relative fat mass. Mm -hmm. So this stuff persists even among people who have uh, a really high level of engagement and structured exercise.